Metro meeting for August 23rd to order. And can we begin with the roll call, please? Director Bosworth. Here. Director Kaufman Gomez. Present. Director Gonzalez. Present. Director Leopold. Here. Director Lynn. Here. Director Matthews. Here. Director Myers. Oh. Director McPherson. Here. Director Pegler. Here. Director Ralphop. Here. Director Rockin. Here. Ex-Vicia Director Northcutt. Ex-Vicia Director Preston. Here. Thank you. Uh, today, Mindy Escueda will introduce our Spanish interpreter. Mindy, if you want to come up and say a few words, I'd appreciate that. Buenos dias, Spanish Thank you. And today's meeting is being broadcast by Community Television of Santa Cruz County. And before we get on with the business at hand, I just want to take a light moment, which is a, might be necessary today, and announce that today is John Leopold's birthday. There you go. <laughs> Uh, Metro uh, director. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Enjoy. Have a happy birthday. Oh, and our technician today is Kingston Rivera. Okay, uh, it's the time for board of directors comments. Any board of directors that have comments they'd like to make? Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, oral written, written communications to the board. Anybody would like to speak to the board at this time? Something that was not on the agenda. I see a hand and someone getting up. So if you'd like to come up to the podium. Oh, you're on your way. Come on up. I'm not sure if this issue is on the agenda or not, but I just wanted to say that I am concerned about the climate chaos that the Earth is now experiencing. There are fires in South America, the Arctic, Greenland, and as of yesterday in California. Um, to decrease our emissions, we need to change our transport system and buses are essential. Over the past week, the Metro buses have been running sporadically with what I understand to be labor issues. Looking to the Green New Deal will be essential to both a path away from fossil fuels and good paying jobs. Santa Cruz and the Metro need the excellent drivers you have and the future drivers. We pay them well. They are essential for our efforts to decrease emissions. They are our climate warming warriors. Thank you. Thank you. I saw another hand. Is there someone else that would like to speak? Oh. Hi, I'm Kate Livingston. I'm representing the parents for SLV High School. Um, I have a daughter who is a, now a freshman, and the bus system, as she said, running sporadically is a concern for a lot of us. Um, there are some parents who are having to take over for others because they can't get to work because the buses aren't running, and we end up getting calls from our children an hour after the bus should have been there saying, hey, Mom, it's still not here. I need to get to class. My daughter had to do the same thing on the second day of school. Hey mom, it's not here yet, I need you to come get me. And I had to leave work to go get her. There is also a gentleman running around in that area that is not safe, especially for our daughters. And so as a mother, I am very concerned that the bus system get back on track so that we know our children are safe. Thank you very much. in La Selva Beach. I come to this meeting as a resident of Santa Cruz County living in La Selva Beach. I am very concerned about the recent letter from Alex Clifford, the CEO of Santa Cruz Metro, dated August 16, 2019, in which he provided excuses. My family has two children with disabilities and we are frequent customers for both your Metro and Terra Cruz services. Consequently, reading this letter is very disconcerting for my family. Specifically, these are my concerns. One, I am concerned about not having metro services to my local bus stops, specifically La Selva Beach Library and Seascape. This is a great disservice and hardship to those needing public transportation in the southern part of the county. Two, 
Children and youth with disabilities, including those in wheelchairs, cannot readily use substitutes for public transportation, as been suggested by our county supervisor, Zach Friend. He has suggested a voucher for Uber or Lyft as substitutes for public transportation. Three, delays in random cancellations due to bus routes cause severe problems for my family. Though I make appointments for pickups at my house, Paracruz is sometimes as much as an hour late in picking up my child. This causes a ripple effect where he is late in arriving at his destination, and I am late for where I need to be, or I need to cancel. The drivers tell us that the office keeps giving them more pickups and changing their route, which is causing the delays. Four, the business model as described by Mr. Clifford, whereby bus drivers were working overtime in order to provide adequate route coverage is unsustainable and needs to be remedied as soon as possible. Having tired bus drivers working overtime is not a viable or sustainable solution. Here are my suggestions. One, stop blaming the union for the issues that have plagued the metro for years. Consider using temporary drivers as other cities have done until the challenge is remedied. Two, upgrade and automate your system so that we can schedule and pay for rides for Paracruz online and do not have to call within your prescribed windows of time. Three, include an app so that consumers of Paracruz can track the ride from pickup to de destinations. If Merced County in the Valley can do this, why can't we do this with buslive.com? Finally, I do commend the drivers for being compassionate, professional, and helpful to me and my children. The dispatch has been commendable in taking my calls and helping us. Thank you for providing the, this opportunity to raise my concerns and suggestions. Anyone else like to speak to us for communication? Seeing none, we'll close that and move on to our written communications from the MAC. Okay, before I get to labor uh, organization communications, I just want to make a small announcement. Uh, everyone in the room obviously noticed that there was some enhanced security today as you arrived. Yes. And I want to make it clear that, that there was a flyer that was sent out to multiple counties uh, invoking union support. And to us at Metro, we don't really know what the impact of that could be. So as a precaution for our employees, you and us and anybody involved, this is a precaution. It is not any kind of a feeling we have towards any Metro employees that make any of us in this room feel unsafe. Joe, so you almost kept us out. Veronica, I, I'm sorry if that was the interpretation, and I apologize for any delay in getting you in the room because I think you know uh, that the last thing we want to do is keep anybody out of this meeting. But, but what we are concerned about is everyone's safety, and sometimes I think we, we've learned through TSA and other ways in the United States we do things that protect people's safety and may cause delays. So with that, I, I just want you to know that, that that's why the, what the situation you see exists. I'm hoping, as we have in the past, that we can have a good, respectful meeting, view all of our thoughts, and deal with all the issues we need to deal with in a professional and courteous manner, and I think we've done that, and you've done that in the past, so I'm hopeful that that will continue through today. So with that, I'd like to uh, have uh, any communications from labor organizations. Thank you, my name is Olivia Martinez. So that email went out because we were told that Metro was going to impose on us on the last best and final. And we wanted support from our union brothers and sisters. I'm a little bit concerned, Chair, that you're raising labor unions to a degree of TSAs. Labor unions are not terrorists. We're not aggressive. We're not evil, and that's really concerning to me that you made that statement. It really hurts as a union member and the history of labor in this country and what has labor has done for all of us, our great-grandparents, our grandparents, our fathers and our sisters. Labor is American, and I'm very concerned with your comment that you made. When you guys decided to put those security and polls in question, who was an employee and who wasn't, you actually changed the working conditions. And I have emailed all the pictures to our attorneys for a per charge. 
because it's a different thing that our members have had to go through. Today we are hoping to have, and we will have, a civil conversation with you. We are meeting with state officials about our concerns with Mr. Clifford's leadership through these negotiations. We had a vote on their last best and final, and the vote was 80% no. We also had a vote about the confidence in his leadership, and 95% of our members said they no longer have confidence in his leadership. We are giving this to our state representatives because it explains the history that we have been dealing with his leadership in Metro. Metro used to be a good place to work at. It is no longer a good place to work at for our members. I want to ask you something. Do you only represent him? Or do you represent every single worker here? Because many of our members have emailed you with concerns, and many, very little of you have responded to them. And that is concerning, that you are not listening to them. This is not about me. This is not about me. My tactics you might not like, and that's okay. But this is about every single worker here that's asking you to help them because they can no longer work under his leadership and they can no longer continue with these negotiations in this way. Your workers have not moved to a strike because they love their job and they know the impact it will cause to families in this county. What I have given you today is what we are giving state representatives. I've also given you this definition of what a cost of increase is, merit increase and equity adjustment. They're three very different things that Mr. Clifford wants to love together and say, because you're above equity, you don't deserve a cost of living increase. That is not true. No public agency is dealing with equity increases that way. The county of, Su the county of Santa Cruz, Mr. McPherson and Leopold, does equity adjustments every single negotiation. They automatically do it and give our members a cost of living increase. We are also giving you the spreadsheet we were talking about, the checks that you authorized, that we heard some of you guys didn't know the amounts of the retro pay of every single manager and their increases. We are also giving you a spreadsheet that says, why have we not had an agreement? We offered an 18-month contract with no increase for the second year, for next June of 2020. And you said, we'll pay to medical. But give us retro. I said, they didn't like that. OK, we took retro off. We have made every single movement, and he has asked from the beginning, no retro pay for salary study, freezing 47 members, taking away comp time, taking away the ability to borrow PTO, paying more towards medical, and using the 5% deal. SEA agreed to pay more to medical. We agreed to remove the retro pay. We agreed to the 5% deal. And he continues to want to freeze 47 members. He wants to continue to take away the PTO and the comp time. I have been very clear with Pat Glenn. I cannot reach an agreement. You have a hundred, I have a hundred percent membership here. There are united brothers and sisters that will stand with the 47. What do you guys want me to do? How can I reach an agreement if those three things are the three things that are holding this, this contract. So I'm pleading with you to please listen to your workforce. This is not about me. This is about them. So thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm just going to touch base a little bit on what Olivia said. She kind of uh, said my whole speech. <laughs> so, uh, good morning, board members. Um, I'm Michael Rios, the PSA Chapter President out of SEIU. Uh, today I'm speaking on the behalf of all of my union brothers and sisters in SEIU. 
I would like to address our current situation with our ongoing negotiations. As you were all aware, we have been negotiating with the district since March 11th of 2019 and have still not yet reached an agreement. On August 8th, Metro gave us their last, best, and final proposal. This proposal consisted of a freeze to 47 members' salaries, no cost of living increase for those 47 members, a removal of the ability to borrow paid time off, the removal of our comp time, and all members paying more towards their medical benefits, and us using the 5% below the median for the CPS results. We took their proposal to our membership and held a vote on Monday, August 19th. The membership voted it down with a vote of 80% rejecting the proposal. We have tried so hard during these negotiations to come to an agreement with Metro. We have offered three different economic proposals ranging from an 18-month contract, a 24-month contract, and even a 36-month contract. Metro has refused all three options. We have already agreed to pay more towards our medical benefits, to use the 5% below the median for the CPS study, and yet Metro still cannot reach an agreement with us. We ask, why is that? Is that because of the paid time off? Is that because of the comp time? What's really holding Metro back from reaching an agreement with us? If it is, these, if it is these, one of these items, please know that these items barely make a financial impact to the district. Metro clearly has money. They are willing to pay managers with huge retro paychecks of up to $30,000 and also recently provided huge increases to most of the managers. The reserves show that they are healthy as well. We also don't understand why Metro is having such a hard time giving these 47 members that came back overpaid in the CPS study a cost of living increase. An equity adjustment is very different from a cost of living increase, but it seems that Metro is disciplining these 47 members for being overpaid by not giving them a COLA. Metro is pretty much saying to our members, sorry, your position came back overpaid, but now you have to deal with inflation with no pay increase and still come to work and give us your all. This doesn't make any sense. Inflation continues to go up, and you are not going to help your employees survive in one of the most expensive areas in the U.S., but are expecting them to go above and beyond at work every day. This does not boost morale. This does not build a happier, loyal staff or employees, nor does this help retain your top employees. Metro has always been about taking care of their employees. Why the sudden change? We have members that work so hard for this agency and continue to go above and beyond for all their managers but yet you refuse to give them a COLA. I really hope that the board understands where we are coming from and really takes the time to help us reach an agreement because this does not feel like the Metro that Santa Cruz knows. Thank you. I've got wheels and so does the podium. Um, <coughs> good morning, um, co-workers, managers, directors, um, public that I don't know. I'm John Doherty and, and part of this is about me and part of this is about the people I work side by side with here at Metro. Um, my contribution this morning, and I wasn't sure I was going to speak, is just to bring across, to share with you that um, part of this has hit me and hit others in unexpected ways. Not having a contract, um, not and now being presented with a last offer, um, having this limbo uh, makes me uncertain, and my other colleagues have mentioned also uncertain about will we be able to pay our rent, will we be able to pay our mortgages in a couple of weeks. <coughs> Um, I also don't really always know where the problems really are because for myself, um, I've used, um, I've borrowed leave, I have um, an accrual of earned comp time, 
And for me, I have used those basically as time. It has the ability, for example, it, when I have needed a break to be able to be off work, not just say Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, but perhaps a couple more days, and then suddenly those two days become, you know, two days plus the weekend. You know, rest, recharge. Um, and in the working conditions, as I've gotten older, and I've had the privilege of serving Metro now for 30 years, I see more and more how precious time is. So I admit to being unsure about why um, annual leave could not be borrowed, and unsure about why earned comp has to go away, because time is so precious. Even if perhaps one person has abused this opportunity, that doesn't mean that many people, including myself, including my coworkers, don't need to have options on time, don't need time away, don't need to be able to say, when a family member asks, can you help me? Yes, I'll clear it with my supervisor, but I can take a couple of days off. So what I want to say is, with regard to leave, with regard to earn comp time, to end them from where I sit, shows a lack of empathy for our coworkers, directors, managers, colleagues. Um, let's reconsider that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Joan here. I just wanted to make sure that you all had this information because we meant to send this to you, but I don't think we have. This is a list of all of the red line positions that under the district's last, best, and final would not get a cost of living increase this year, next year, or the year after. And once again, we haven't had a cost of living increase since 2015. So I want to pass this out so that you're aware the numbers of people in each position are all indicated on this column. Um, I want to point out that some of the lowest paid workers at the district are on this list. Custodial workers, vehicle service workers. Um, it, you know, you can see the numbers and I just think it would be good if you had this information. So who can I give this to? Give it to Gina. Uh, thank you. Make sure we all do. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Bonnie Moore, I'm a labor representative for the Smart Union. Um, I've had an employee here of the Transit District and I've been here for quite a while. I've already had my 30th year anniversary, even though I'm not physically on site all the time, but I'm here, I don't leave. Um, I just want you to know that in my past experience here of having labor unrest, the, the requirement or the need for the community, this board as a board, and the employers here is to figure out how to have labor harmony because you have to still come back and work with everybody here continuously it doesn't end here and when you have this type of labor unrest continue it doesn't benefit anybody especially our community and it's unfortunate that people are being treated the way that they are so i'm just asking you for multiple reasons one this show of security is ridiculous yeah. it is absolutely years of, of labor issues that have come and gone and they've come and gone since the late 70s all the way throughout we have never had a situation here that is required to you know the need of a TSA type of support system <laughs> I understand and I accept you know I'm thankful that you know you apologize for the situation and you were concerned about everybody's safety this is a safe group of people this is who we are it's one thing to have some security out there that's, you know, preventing some issue. You don't do it at city council. People come in all the time and have to talk about what they need to say. But to hamper someone from the public, especially somebody with a disability, to be able to come into this meeting, a public meeting, yep. is wrong. Yep. And it's a violation. To make me go park all the way up on the top and have to try to walk down and navigate downhill 
when there's a, a spot down below that gives me the ability to park in a, a parking place that's allowed for somebody with a disability, you know, that's a violation to me. Shame on you. You don't deserve that. You should think better, you should think better. You should think better and higher of these employees and who they've been over the years and who they will be into the future. And that's up to you guys. Put the money in the Brandon, before you speak, just, I just want to make sure I mention um, And I'm sorry if the, the statement that I made was misinterpreted. I'm only going to give you the factual experience that I have. In the city of Capitola, if we feel that there's any kind of a meeting that, potential, that may pose a potential problem or security for any of our citizens or any member in the room, we have had security. Unfortunately, this is not a reflection on Metro. This is not a reflection on anything but the state of our country. And I'm sorry for that. But it is, it's a necessary thing because if you anticipate that there is any kind of a problem and you don't do anything about it, it falls under a, a rule called negligence. If you anticipate that something's going to happen and you do nothing, then you're being negligent. And what we are here for is just the protection of everybody in the room. That includes you. And as I stated in the beginning, there is never a potential threat that we felt from any Metro employee or any problem with that whatsoever. But when we bring people from outside counties that we don't know or we're unsure about, we don't know how to respond. And I will apologize again, up and down, if you're offended, because that was not our intent. But, 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 but you need to understand is that I know that in our city, and I think in other cities, this is done on a regular basis. And it's unfortunate, and it's not, uh, you know, you can say that it's not, but I, I know I've done it, and we've called for it, and it has happened. So this is a fact. Okay, Brendan, come up. It's actually a good transition if I just said that. So I understand what you're saying about security and I get you know your points on things like that. I think something that needs to be said here that you don't realize is this is not because of security that we feel this way, that you're trying to suppress us, that you're trying to control us, that you're trying to keep us down. That is Metro culture. That's where we're at. Every time we walk in the building, that's how it feels. Every time someone gets disciplined for the first time and it's a five day suspension. That's how it feels. Regardless of whether or not how our vote went, it's important for me to let you realize that although we have not been as vocal as SEIU, we haven't had no confidence votes and things like that, um, I'm not used to being the least vocal of our membership about something. And we have done what we can to keep it professional and keep it off but making comments, blaming management issues on drivers. Really think about what you're making us feel like and what our morale is when you're moving forward on this stuff. Because right now, I gotta pause to not say some of the things I'd like to say. I've been here a long time. I've been driving for a long time. But we don't deserve to get treated this way. We are not your slaves. We are not numbers where people treat us like it. Yeah. Thank you, Raymond, for those comments. Appreciate it. Hi, Susan Scottsky again. I'm just, you know, walking into all this and hearing, you know, how the bus drivers are feeling. And I'm, I'm really feeling, you know, sad because they do provide a very, very good service. And I think at the end of the day, Board, and um, Mr. Clifford needs to understand that our mission, and I, I'm involved in a lot of public meetings, and we always read our mission statement, and let's get back to this, to provide a public transportation service that enhances personnel mobility and creates a sustainable transportation option in Santa Cruz County through a cost-effective, reliable, accessible, safe, clean, and courteous transit service. And I think that's how would we want to be treated, you know, at the end of the day. And I really want our bus drivers to be treated appropriately. And to hear that they haven't had a raise since 2015 is very, very concerning. And they're not feeling supported. And they're the reason that we're here, Metro. They're, they're the, you know, they do everything that we, we need. They, they show up, they want to work, but they need to have appropriate, kind conditions and feel supported. And to not have a raise since 2015 is con concerning. 
So anyway, thank you again. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Nathan Meisenheimer with the Parks Department. Just across the street, right over there at the maintenance facility. Um, just wanted to say a, a couple of things. Uh, one, that the public perception might just be focusing on the drivers, but it also includes everybody. The drivers, us, people here in the office, everybody across the way, everybody across the way over there. Um, the, the ability to provide safe and clean transportation is not just on the drivers. It's not their responsibility to make sure that these buses are running smoothly. It's everybody's responsibility to make sure that they're clean for the public to come on, to clean the, the nastiness from some of the uh, citizens that are using the, the, our facilities is weighing heavy on a lot of people. A lot of people that take care of a lot of stuff that most people don't even know exist. And I'm sure that, uh, that the people that ride the bus like a clean bus and like a good operating bus, one that's not gonna break down on the road and that weighs heavily on a lot of the guys over there at the maintenance department and the VSWs and even the custodial department. You should see some of the stuff that we have to deal with in the parts department that we see affecting everybody within the Metro company from the bathrooms to the buses to the facility buildings. We see it all um, over there in the parts department. And I'd like to point out that even though there is almost half of us that are getting redlined because of this class and comp study. Um, basically, we had our jobs revised. They wanted to know what we do, so we did that. And it turned our one and a half page job description into a three page job description with no increase in pay. We're getting redlined. There's five of us in our parts department. None of us are getting a raise, nothing. Although we do more than most of the other facilities, um, bus operations that we were compared with. We went through them time and time again, like this one doesn't do that, this one doesn't do that, this one doesn't do that. And we feel that's very unfair. And I just wanted to point that out. Um, that also falls onto some of the other red lines. They had their job descriptions changed as well. They're getting told to do this and do this and do this and we do this and we do this based on past practice. Why? Because we do what's right for Metro. We do what's right for the whole company. Everybody does more than their fair share, but now it's in the job description. And now it's like none of the other agencies have to do that. They get paid more than we do, but for some reason, we can't get a bump in pay. I just don't think that's very fair. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak? Morning. My name is Elmer Torres. I work in Santa Cruz Metro for over 20 and a half years. Um, I just want to say something about this whole negotiation thing. And I'm going to speak on one item, like the on call for our facilities workers. Work on down, we're asking for a little increment on that. During my years here, we've always been getting a dollar and fifty cents to be on the call. And that was turned down, we were asking for a little increment on that. We do get over time when we get called in. Many times when you are enjoying for members with your families, your Sunday, I find myself snaking main lines at per se watching the traffic center all of the bathrooms are getting backed up and all of that. And to hear that you want to keep me down that way, a dollar fifteen an hour to be on call. I can not go out of town because I have to respond within an hour to the job site when that happened. It is a little difficult for me to take it really. Especially when you hear some of the managers got this big increment. Don't you think that's kinda of unfair for? You approve that for them. I'm not asking for a lot. But what about the minimum wages to be at home? Consider that. Thank you.
Anyone else? Okay, uh, we're going to move on. Uh, is there any additional documentation? Yeah. I want to thank everybody that came up and spoke. I appreciate all the comments. Uh, any additional documentation for agenda items? <laughs> ones that are there. Okay, good. All right, then we're going to move on to the consent agenda. These are items we normally deal with in one motion. Is there anyone who would like to pull anything from the consent agenda? Yes. Sorry, Olivia, yes, we do. Um, the job descriptions that you're going to review for the comprehensive salary study, we feel we need to pull those because that's part of the comprehensive salary study. We don't think you should approve it until we um, have a, an agreement in regards to the salary study because they go hand in hand. And so we're hoping that you don't approve them until we have a full agreement of the comprehensive salary study. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to speak? Go ahead. I just want to remind the board that back in November, I believe it was, um, I personally brought those position descriptions to you as a in concept type of situation. Would you have already um, approved those position descriptions? What we've done now is added the um, I think it's FLSA on the top and some other things on the position descriptions, but the body of the position descriptions um, on an aggregate level has not changed. This is just bringing it back for the final consideration. Yeah. Sure. Um, I'm sure what you said is accurate. I'm sure what you said is accurate, but my question is, is there some problem that this would put off for a month? I don't um, is there something we have to do with them that uh, you know, will, will make it difficult for us because we just put them off for a month? So the position descriptions that you approved back in, I'm going to say November, I don't exactly remember exactly what it was. Um, those position descriptions were used when they went forward to be used for the compensation piece. Yeah, so, and, I, and I'm not trying to undo that. I don't think we're going to undo right. that. I mean, the issue about the bargaining is not about these job descriptions per se. But, uh, I'm just wondering if there's any consequences if we just simply put these off for a month. I'll defer to Alex. I think my only uh, thought is that there are some job titles that have changed, and so as, as we recruit, we're recruiting the new job titles and you know, the field job titles. Uh, what do, you, do you know if we have any recruitments coming up right now where that's impacted? Yeah, we've had um, you, want to come, you want to come to your microphone? Good morning, everybody. My name is Monique, and I work in the HR department. Uh, some of the positions that we had issues for recruitment has been the custodial service worker two, that now, after the study, is going to be called lead custodial service worker. Um, and kind of, it, it was hard to recruit for that position because we have now a new job description with a new title that looks similar to what it used to be our lead custodial lead custodial worker now called supervisor. So for us in the HR department, it's important that we go to the board with a new scheme of job titles. So it's easier for us to recruit without mentioning and adding more stuff in the documents that we have to go in our website. Thanks. Other, I guess one other question is, um, I read through these uh, back in November and again now. Um, I. There's nothing in here about the issues that are in dispute about you know whether we should um, uh, pay people retroactively. I mean, all the issues that are still in dispute are not in these job descriptions. They're simply the description of the job that we're using to hire people. Um, I'm asking whether I'm accurate in my understanding of that. I believe you are, and we've gone through an exhaustive process months ago, which the union has bought off on all of these job descriptions. So. Um, I raise that possibility, but I am concerned. If, if we're trying to go out, we have problems in, in vacancies and people who are being asked to do more than one job. And so I, I do think we need to move ahead on our hiring. So although I raised this question about the possibility of putting it off, I don't think it makes sense given that we're trying to actually hire people based on these job descriptions and given that it's got no connection to the things that we are disagreeing about in terms of how people are compensated and so forth. It's not about the job description itself, so I'm prepared to move ahead and support this. 
Okay, the, the item has not been pulled, and so we're not having a comment. Now, you are up. I'm going to allow you to speak on this, okay? But we're not discussing this per se. So go ahead with your comment, though. Okay, thank you. Um, again, during this study, um, we were asked to put everything that we do on a daily basis. Um, and we did this um, knowing that we were or possibly getting um, uh, compensated correctly. For, you know, a lot of us do, like we were, we were said, we do a lot more than what our job descriptions already say. Um, so for you guys to improve the job descriptions before we get the equity part of it, I don't think that's right. You know, we can't just give all these people all this extra stuff to do and expect them to do them without getting some kind of compensation. That was part of the agreement that a lot of the, a lot of the agreement that we made on adding more job duties was based on, with the salary study, there are other stuff in terms of agreement of confidentiality, non-confidentiality stuff for some of the accounting people was based in agreement if the salary study, so in good faith, we made an agreement based on the salary study. We might not have a TA in a year, right? We might not be able to get an agreement here. I don't know. We haven't been able. And you're going to approve something that is part of a salary as well. So, okay. Thank you. Okay. So, my, my observation is that um, people were not given new job duties. They were asked to describe what they're already being asked to do. And that's how these job descriptions yeah. they were interviewed. That's not People were interviewed and asked, what do you do in your job? I now this worked. I got into a lot of detail on the committee I was on. And they asked, what, what do you do in your job? And they came back and they said, I do this, I do this, I do right And some of those things were not in the old job descriptions, so they were added. Then there's a process where people in the, doing the study try and figure out, well, how much, should, you know, should there be some change in pay um, related to this as we compare people doing similar jobs and so forth? There's apparently disagreement, and that's fine, about what the new piece, what the uh, additional language in the job descriptions is about. But it's not that this is asking people to do new things they're not currently doing. They're going to say, now we're going to make you do some new stuff. It's stuff that people are already doing. So I don't think there's any benefit to the employees to, to decide that we're going to argue about what people are doing. The question's going to be, and there's disagreement about it. How should the compensation system work around that? And we continue to disagree about that, and we'll, that'll be worked out at the negotiating table. But I don't see any reason why these job descriptions, which are more or less accurate descriptions of what people are actually doing, not, people are not saying, I'm not doing these things. They're saying, I should be paid more for them. That's a different question, and that's not in the action that's before us today. Here, there's simply the job descriptions, and I think we should approve them. Well, point of word, at this point, the item will need to be pulled by a director if we're going to have any further discussion on this. So my question at this point, is there any director that would like to pull an item? I don't want to stop discussion, so I'd be happy to pull it if there's other people who want to comment on it. If you want to pull it, then we'll pull it and we'll discuss it at the end. Would you like to pull the item? Yes, please. Okay, then we're going to have a request uh, to pull item 915. But I'm making clear that I'm most likely going to vote for it. We'll see what the comments are. Okay. It's just one, I just want to follow the process. So is there any other? Yes. Do you have a comment that can make? Go ahead, James. Well, this is actually in reference to 9-13. Uh, sure. The consent agenda. Uh, I have a I have a concern because it's stating that our union was involved with the discussions for uh, the vision insurance and I'm here to confirm that we were not. So I would like, I would request that that item gets pulled so we could get a little bit of information about what's happening with our vision insurance and what the changes are going to be. Let me see if I get some clarification. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So the other thing is that... Hang on, let me have her speak first and you can look at uh, well, I'm here in representation of Don Cromay, the HR director, and it's my understanding that she sent an email to the union, to uh, to the union, with information of the change of the contract, and they did not respond to that email. So we did send the she did send that that email with information of the change of his contract, and just to add to that, we um, there is no changes on what the level of benefit for the employee. There is no change. It's exactly the same thing, the same benefit with VSP. Uh, the only thing that we change is that we no longer are going with VSP directly. Now we are going with Alliant Insurance Services, but the level of service is the same. The same copayment, the same, everything is the same. Thank you for that clarification. That's a contractual item. 
It's, uh, it's a manda uh, mandatory subject of bargaining. Don, the HR, nor Alex ever gave us a letter with these changes. That's up for negotiations. That's another per charge I have here. Okay, so we're you. asking you to pull it. Okay, thank you for that. I'd like to clarify real quick. Your agenda says we approved it. Your HR department just said we didn't respond to the email. Either way, we want you to pull it because it's not factual. Just because we didn't respond, pretty sure HR has multiple phone numbers for us. Thank you. Is there any urgency on, on approving this? Is one would be my question. Like, I had a question about whether or not we have a time constraint on the contract. We do because these ones. We've got to go to the microphone. We're out the record. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this contract became effective 81 of 2019, so we are already paying a certain <laughs> like, company. So, yes, it is. Do your opinion is urgent. Okay. It's right now. It is. Yeah, no, I, I think we should proceed. We've done what we do oftentimes when there is a need to solicit uh, union contact uh, you know, feedback. We send them emails and provide them the documents, ask them to review them. We give them a certain amount of time to respond. Um, you know, I think Mr. Brendan's response is not uh, not accurate. He should look at his email and make his response. There is nothing being changed in the contracts and the level of benefits. Uh, if there was, then we would have met, met and conferred with the unions about that. We're not open for discussion right now. I'm going to need some clarification on a procedure. Is there any director that would like to pull this item? Okay, one last comment, Lydia. Yeah, John, go ahead. Well, I mean, uh, I'm interested in finding out the information from our attorney, whether this is uh, something which is uh, some subject to negotiations. Uh, you know, that, it, it, that has been brought up. Um, I, my, my only concern is if we'd like to pull the item to discuss it. I, I thought I'm going to do it. Would you like to sure. Let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to pull items uh, 913 and 915, and we're going to move them to uh, any other items we want to talk about. I, I have a question that's not going to need to be pulled. Okay, let me, let me okay, deal with these two first. This, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna, we're going to move uh, 913, 915, and, and uh, we're going to make them. Uh, so we're going to click them. I'm going to put them after uh, 17, so it'll be 17 A and B. Okay, so. Yeah, 18. Oh, uh, well, no, 18 is a different item. 17 A and B. We have item 17, so I'm just going to make it 17 A and B. Uh, for 913, will be 17 A, 17 B. And now your question on another topic. Uh, on item 906, which is uh, grants, on the final page of that report, page four, it's uh, item grant number 38 and 39, uh, which are for the Pacific Station expansion. It shows those grants expiring in uh, September of 2019. And um, I just want to make sure that they're being renewed, or what, what's the... Uh, yeah, what's, what's the uh, status of that money? I hate to leave a million dollars. Let me clarify very quickly. Good morning, Bear Armisen, Planning Director, Chair, Board, Staff, and Guests. Um, there's not a million dollars left. There's 137 of I have uh, my glasses off to catch up with you. It was originally in 2007 a million dollar grant that we spent $857,000 working on concepts to go back before five, six years ago, the concepts that were developed. Uh, we got special permission to extend these two grants for as many years as we have, and we're actually spending down little bits of it right now by the, for the work for Mark Thomas and Boyle and Associates. And if in the end we have to give a few thousand back because we couldn't spend it on eligible activities, like I said, we'll be up over 900,000 out of a million. And we got special permission. We should have had to get it back three or four years ago. So we feel it's been a very big help in our ongoing work. If I can just point out, I think you've just uh, given us an insight into a column that we should add to this table, which is for moving down. Yeah, yes, yeah. There's a positive out of that conversation. Thank you. 
Okay, so any other items on the consent agenda that the any director has a question or concern about? Motion by Rodkins, second by Kaufman Gomez. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Consent calendar carries. And so let's see the other items being moved to the regular agenda. So with that, we're going to go on to the regular agenda. This is uh, our presentation of employee longevity awards, and I'll turn it over to uh, Rodkins. So we have several employees who have recognition. We have several employees who have uh, are receiving recognition um, for their longevity and service to this district and the community. Um, I'm not sure who, who among them are here. Um, so the, the first is okay. So the, thank you. So the first one. First of all, I'm going to say the name even if they're not here. First one's for Clarence Aragon, who, um, who's uh, receiving a 10-year uh, longevity award. Um, and uh, Clarence is a very, I mean, there's information about each of these folks, which we should be aware of. These are people who have made a long-term commitment to this district. Clarence is a very conscientious operator committed to performing the very best in customer service. He's well respected by the riders because of his safe driving and courteous manner. His affinity for performing magic tricks has entertained his coworkers on many occasions. <laughs> Secondly, we have um, Julio Garcia Velasco. Julio is a second generation operator following his father Pedro's footsteps. Julio delivers a high level of customer service for which he's well known by our bus riding public. His commitment to excellence and professionalism has earned him the title of line instructor, allowing him to convey his attributes to newly hired operators. Next, we have Lisa Mitchell, who is here, I believe. At least I've told you is. Nope. All right, well, I'll be here as well. And um, Lisa's also a tenure employee. Um, Lisa's been a valued employee in 10 years of her tenure at Metro. Both the riding public as well as her peers and supervisors greatly appreciate her dedication, commitment, and professionalism in her manner of performing her duties as a Metro operator. She's always willing to go the extra mile and learn new things. Her cheerful and pleasant smile is always welcoming to all. Next we have someone who uh, I believe is not here but well known by most of us, Eduardo Montesino. His career started as an operator, always committed. He's coming in September. I won't read it now, so we'll hear about it in the next month. Next we have um, Salvador Calderon, who I believe is here. But Salvador is appreciated and respected by the riding public. His peers, supervisors, and managers alike uh, like him not only for his high level of professionalism and courtesy, but also in his care of service to his riders. His deep resonating voice commands a high level of respect and has been used in making announcements on Metro buses with good results. Next we have Sergio Lona Gonzalez. Sergio has completed the three decades of transportation service to the community of Santa Cruz. His commitment to excellence has not wavered during this time. He's been ready and willing to take on more, filling when required, and drive any bus on any route whenever needed. His dedication to safety, courtesy, customer service is unsurpassed. Throughout his career, Sergio has demonstrated adaptability to handle a variety of circumstances and situations that have resulted in controlled and thoughtful approaches to solutions and many grateful Metro riders. Jose Herrera. Jose? No. During his tenure, Jose has shown his commitment to Metro, Metro's community of customers by his record of great attendance. More than just showing up for every shift, he brought his wisdom and adaptability to deal with difficult situations and people while still exhibiting excellent personal relationship skills with customers and co-workers alike. He shows his pride by providing the very best in customer service, utilizing his bilingual abilities to serve the monolingual Metro riders. All appreciate his quiet, respectful demeanor. And then Richard Orozco, in Richard's 20-year tenure at Metro, he's received the Safe Driver Awards in 2004, 2006, 2007, 2015, and 2019 for a total of nine years of safe driving. Oh, he has other years of safe driving, but he won the award for nine years. <laughs> All I've appreciated is his attention to safety, his dedication and commitment to the delivery of services relied on daily. Richard not only pilots a bus for Metro, but also possesses a pilot's license, allowing him to fly aircraft much to the pleasure of his fellow operators. 
We also have uh, awards for uh, Chris Kane and A.J. Doherty, but uh, those will be read at a, at a later meeting. Well, no, we have, we have John's. We just John's here. Get, we didn't get John's bio. Okay. Well, I can tell you about John. He's been here a very long time serving the disability community in Santa Cruz and working for this district in a way that makes a big difference to the people who depend upon our service for those who cannot necessarily ride our regular buses, but even those who sometimes do but need special help and being able to do so. So we definitely want to appreciate John's service to the, to the district. Um, I serve Metro today as, an as the, only our second accessible services coordinator. And I want to share with everyone that over the years, a lot has changed. Um, when I started to use Metro buses, I was a UCSC student. And during my tenure, I had the pleasure of doing field study and uh, reporting to Mike Rotkin as I worked on a project for one class. Also, I want to say that back then, long ago, in a galaxy far away, when that door opened, there were a few steps. And so I would lift my arms, my crutches would dangle, and I grabbed whatever I could grab, and I could heave myself in there and ride. Fortunately, before the Americans with Disabilities Act changed what buses were like everywhere, here, Santa Cruz Metro, Scott Galloway, Les White, and others, we're all ahead of that big change, ahead of that civil rights law, because at Metro, we got ramps on buses before it was required. At Metro, we involved people with disabilities before it was put in statute. And also here at Metro, having a position like accessible services coordinator, we set things up so that when person needed one-to-one -one attention or a couple needed to practice with someone to use our services, um, or even as I did yesterday, um, an older adult came in with her scooter and needed some help to know where to put on some straps so it would be easier for her to get on and off a bus. Um, we got that covered. I want to say that for me, Metro is confirmed for me with what I've been doing at Metro and what I did before, that I am a public servant. And I am pleased to serve the public today. I am pleased to be serving it next week, especially when I get to meet a young man in Watsonville who's looking for the first time to take his mobility aid out on a bus. So, um, you know, thank, thank you for this opportunity to be recognized. Thank you. So those who are not here will be seeing these plaques with us. Okay, uh, this is item 11. This is the CEO World Report. Chair, Director, uh, yes, just a couple of items. Hopefully you hear me okay. And I apologize in advance if I don't get the pronunciation of the names right. I apologize for that. Uh, we do have a number of uh, new hires and some promotions that have occurred and are occurring. Um, we have uh, hired four paratransit drivers, and of course you'll meet those folks at a future board meeting when they, they graduate. So uh, I'll introduce those folks at that time. Um, also 12 bus operators going through class right now. That's fairly exciting. And uh, we hope that they will all be there on graduation day. We need them uh, to fill at least nine vacancies that we currently have. Um, we have hired Gabriel Moreno as a uh, Facilities Maintenance Mechanic 1. We hired uh, Jose Nama Pica, Tamar Pica, I apologize again for that, uh, Facilities Maintenance Mechanic 1. And uh, he is a promotion from a vehicle service worker 2, so that's an internal. Um, I should also point out that one of our bus operators is going to class right now, one of those 12, 
is a vehicle service worker one. So there is opportunity to, to move up in the organization, and we're excited to see that. Uh, we have a promotion of uh, Luis Abundes Camacho, and he's moving from a custodial service worker one to a lead custodian. And then Manuel Madrigal, Madrigal moving from a vehicle service one to a vehicle service two. And then we just also hired Caitlin Nelson as our financial analyst. Uh, that's a new hire. So it's been a busy month for the HR department and also for our training department both on the paratransit side and on the bus operations side. Um, and then also sort of a, a sad announcement, but we're very sort of proud to make it an announcement and wish one of our employees well. Uh, Aaron Alvey, as you all know, as our uh, Director of Purchasing and Procurement, has taken a job uh, with another entity, and uh, this will be her last day here. And we're really excited for her and her future, although she will leave behind a great big hole here in that department. Um, she's been here, I think, 17 years, Erin, is that right? Almost 15. Almost 15? Okay. Um, Still a long time with 17 years worth of work. A lot of long time. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. I, I should point out that uh, Aaron, uh, more recently, is most notable for helping us to actually complete the JKS, the GK Sousa building. As you might recall, when we when we lost our uh, project manager for that, and we went out and we hired a project manager to come in, you, you can't just hire a project manager and say, you know, our management company and say, go do this for us and let us know when it's done. They do have to be managed. And Erin dove in, she saw a void there, uh, uh, and dove right in and took that over without questioning it. Helped us to coordinate with Hill International to get that project built. Then worked with us through a number of different uh, things that we had that we sort of de-scoped and that we had to complete after the fact once we were done with the developer of that project. She carried us through all of that, and uh, it was a happy day when we were able to do the ribbon cutting. Erin had a heck of a lot to do with that. I will also tell you that in this new adventure that we're embarking upon, in which we will have electric buses at this agency, uh, they don't just arrive and you don't just plug them into a 110 socket and, and hope that everything works fine. Uh, that's a major undertaking to design your yard, redesign your yard so that it can uh, accommodate electric charging facilities for buses. Erin has been shepherding that project, and as a result of her work, uh, which we will continue to carry on in her absence, we hope to have that electric infrastructure in place by December 31st, so that when our first electric buses arrive early next year, we can plug them in and put them in service. Uh, and thank you, Erin, for all of that and for uh, <laughs> many years of great service to the agency. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little uh, bittersweet, so I kind of vacillate from being happy and being sad, so <laughs> um, thank you very much for your support. I appreciate it. It was a difficult decision. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Any questions for our Okay. Move on to item 12. This is consideration of the appointment of James Van Hendy to the Metro Advisory Committee for a term ending December 31st, 2021. I move the recommended action. I just want to make comments on that committee. We had uh, a lot of uh, applicants for that job, and it was, uh, it was an interesting discussion we had, and uh, this gentleman seemed very qualified and happy to have him on board. So with that, uh, anybody from the public? I want to weigh in on that. Ah, uh, Ronnie, come on up. Okay. Oh, okay. Do I, did I miss the podium? Well, <laughs> John, John's going to help you. John's here. Thank you. Go to the left a little bit. Go straight. Oh, 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 Warm call, warm call. <laughs> um, first off, I wanted to thank the ad hoc committee. I'm Veronica Elsey, and I'm chair of the Metro Advisory Committee. Wanted to thank the ad hoc committee for their work. Uh, James actually did attend 
our meeting on Wednesday night, and I'm really looking forward to working with him. I think he's going to be great. Um, so he's already shown us his commitment to the committee, so I think that was a, a really good um, selection. And second, I just wanted to give the board a heads up because um, we were told at our meeting that you were considering holding the application period open a little longer um, to wait till the various universities came back into session and to get more applicants for the second open position and then combining that with the position which will be expiring in December. So I wanted to say that I thought that was the right choice so you wouldn't have to recreate your ad hoc committee again. Um, and then just to give you a heads up that in light of that, and we have done this once before, at our November 20th meeting would be the time when we select the chair, uh, the new chair for 2020, and set our calendar for 2020. And what I am going to suggest here and going to make the suggestion at the meeting in November is that we select our chair for 2020 and select the date of the first meeting so that then when we have our first meeting, our new members can participate in selecting the calendar for the remainder of the year since that is something that the committee does. Um, so I just wanted to give you a heads up that we were considering doing that just to um, be fair for everyone. And that the good news is that because our attendance has been so excellent that being one short, we are still going to have six members in November. We will definitely have a quorum and be able to act on anything that's presented to us at the agenda. Thank you. Thanks for your comments, Veronica. Comments, great. Just to add to that, um, we, we have a tremendous amount of very, very good, well-qualified applicants. And we looked at the strengths and weaknesses of what we had for that particular board to make sure that we're filling the gaps that we really needed. And the gap of the Cabrillo College is a big one because we know that we have a, a significant amount of ridership there. And uh, so I've taken that conversation also with the Cabrillo campus that's in Watsonville and forwarded to them this particular opening so that they can start encouraging and passing it along to staff and, um, per, and the, the class that are, are just coming on board with Cabrillo so that we can really identify the uh, a Cabrillo um, applicant for that seat that's uh, vacant for that position there. So I'm, I'm hoping that we'll see something come of that quickly and um, we certainly look forward to making sure that we do have a full board there. Director yeah. um, So should, should we assume that at our next meeting we'll make an appointment either of someone from Cabrillo or from the list of qualified applicants that we got before? We, we held it for Cabrillo for a Cabrillo person instead of, because it, it's loose enough that we could have done someone else for that position, but looking at who we already had there for representation, we really want to keep it for a Cabrillo, and they hadn't started school, so... No, no, I get that part, but yeah. at, the, at our next meeting, if we're unable to find a Cabrillo, will we just appoint someone from this list? I wouldn't hold us to the next meeting, but possibly the meeting after okay. that, so that would, that would be the lead, the, the lead way I'd like to, to give on that. We're trying to be very optimistic, and uh, I think Veronica is on board with this, which means that we're going in the right direction. So. Yeah, and the question was, are you going to combine it because we have a position that expires in December? Um, combine those two together. Yeah, that's part of the action. Director McPherson, I'm very happy to hear the uh, very complimentary comments about Mr. Von Hendry, who happens to reside in the fifth sip of zero. <laughs> 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 That was a swaying factor, just saying. So yeah. Anyway, thank you for those comments, Monica. With that, uh, we have a motion. I, I make the motion for recommendation. We already did. Yeah, Mike, that's right. We had a motion. Yeah, that's right. We call that. That's a, we call that. Thank you. We have that. So, uh, with that, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It carries unanimously. We're glad to have Mr. Von Hendy aboard. Um, item 13, this is consideration of ratification of a contract with Central Electric Company. Aaron, I <laughs> know, you know, and this is probably going to be a nice formal <laughs> action, but, but after you get done with this, if you want to take a few moments to make some comments and highlight your career, I'd be happy to give you that anyway, so. Let's get through this first. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this 
item is a ratification. Uh, we went out to bid for a contractor to install the electrical um, vehicle charging infrastructure at our DDK Sousa operations facility across the street. Uh, this is going to set us up for um, 10 bays of charging. We've already ordered four um, Proterra buses. Um, we're beginning engineering and design reviews uh, coming up in a couple of weeks, so those buses are, are um, going to be in production soon. Uh, this particular contract is uh, um, with Central Electric Company. Uh, they were the uh, single bidder. Uh, we did uh, reach out to the contracting community in Northern California the best um, that we could. Um, we did a lot of outreach efforts. and. In the end, um, we had about three contractors we were dealing with, and only one submitted. So, uh, but we're very happy with uh, Central Electric. They're a really good company um, out of Watsonville, um, long-time family company um, from the area. So we're really excited about that. Um, we're already off and running. That's why this is a ratification. The um, equipment that needs to be manufactured for the, the switch gear um, takes several months, so we really wanted to get this contract going and get the uh, equipment ordered so that we can meet our deadline of December, uh, I believe it's December 20th here in, in 19 to get this done. Um, so uh, that, that is this item we asked for the contract value, which is uh, 550. 3,349 with a little bit of contingency in there. Um, this item is fully funded by our LC Top grant, which is great. Um, the contingency in all, it's about $650,000. Um, we also have a great uh, design team on board, Bowman Williams, a local um, civil engineering company. Um, I see heads everyone's familiar with. They've been uh, wonderful. They were our on-call engineer and they're going to stay with us through this project. Um, Fair Engineering did the design. Fair and Tony from Central Electric have also known each other for a long time, so they're, 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 they're again, they're off and running. This is, this is um, um, I'm very excited to, that before I go, <laughs> um, this, is, this is happening and I can hand it off, and I'm confident that uh, the project team is going to be able to bring this to, to uh, completion. And, and We'll have some chargers before we get our buses, which has been our goal. So, any questions? Thank you, Aaron. Mr. Clipper had a comment. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to add sort of a general comment. Uh, you notice this is a ratification, which means we've already taken action and we're coming to you and asking for you to prove the action we've already taken. We don't do a lot of those. We try to avoid doing those. And when we do them, we try to make sure that there's a lot of rationale for that. Uh, oftentimes, in August, you see ratifications because you're dark in July. And it just means we tried, tried, we couldn't get an item to you in June before you went dark. But because of the timing, especially in this case, in order to get the infrastructure in by December 31st, so we thought we need to go ahead and proceed and then hope that you would approve it. Uh, if you choose not to approve it, we'll cancel the contract, but uh, we hope that you will approve it. Director Leopold. Um, thank you, Chair. You know, this is an important, uh, uh, one of our first steps in the, the future of our bus uh, uh, fleet. Um, the, our goal is to go for all electric buses, zero emission buses by uh, 2040. Um, and to do that, we need to make sure that we have the right infrastructure, um, uh, the right equipment. Uh, I really appreciate all the hard work that you put in to, um, to helping us find that right piece. Uh, and it's something that we as a community can be proud of, that, we're, that we are taking this important first step of purchasing these buses, buses and, and reducing the emissions from uh, our vehicles. And I just want to uh, personally thank you for your years of service uh, uh, to the Metro. Uh, uh, in all the years that I've been here, you've always uh, been able to present information clearly and, and concisely and effectively. Uh, and you know, uh, you're going out as a blonde, you know, you've had different hair colors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm trying to cover the gray. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, we could go through the years and look at the color of your hair, and, and, yeah. and, and we'll know what yeah. um, phase we're in. Yeah. Anyway, I wish you the best of luck in your new position. Thank we'll you very much. Much. Director Rodkin. First, I want to agree with John's comments about your service to the district. It's been extraordinary. Uh, I do have two questions. 
Could you tell us anything that you might know about the capacity of that yard to charge all of our buses someday? I mean, in terms of space. Absolutely, it's, it's very space constricted. So that is the next phase. We have hired a company called Center for Transportation and the Environment, CTE, out of Atlanta. Uh, I'm sure you've met uh, Steve uh, Claremont and some of uh, um, Lauren, um, sorry, Lauren, uh, at, at conferences. They've been really putting together this um, industry for us in public transit for, for electric buses. Um, so they're going to come in, they're going to help us today get through um, implementing these first four buses. They're going to assist planning with routes. Um, and then they're going to help us figure out the next step. Um, it's, there's so many approaches to how to charge that yard. Um, there's a lot of people that are just getting started and we've sort of been giving the board this message for a few years of go slow, let's see how it develops, give some of these companies time to get some experience. Um, really get experience <laughs> and get their products together. Um, yeah, there's several ways to win. It's going to be a challenge. It's going to be multiple um, um, solutions as well. There's going to be some charging at the yard. There might be some charging at maintenance. Um, we'll have some. <laughs> we'll have some uh, fast chargers at some of our transit centers, which will help with the load. Um, it's yeah, it's going to be um, a lot of planning and preparation but um, take it slow and, and do it right and we'll get there. Um, I think we're fortunate that we have a CNG station, we have CNG buses, we're gonna continue to buy CNG buses till about 2028, um, so that when they're at the end of their useful life, it's, it's 2040 and they can go. So um, I think we have a little bit of time to figure that out. Um, it's gonna really depend on the bus manufacturers uh, a lot of what type of charging is going to be required for these buses. Um, and again, I think there's some really good players in the industry that are just getting started that have some good solutions. We've been talking to them all. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we have a little bit of time. This 10, uh, there's actually a contract with Proterra for 10 buses as well. So as we get additional grant funding, we will continue to buy the same bus, um, which will be which is good, it's difficult in public agencies and procurement to, to get the same manufacturer or the same product when you go through bidding processes. So we do know we'll have the first four, the first 10, all Proterra's all gonna be the same charger. <coughs> and then we'll see, it could be overhead charging, it could be inductive charging, it could be the fueling station becomes a sort of charge, charger itself and pushes it out. So. Lots of ways to win. <laughs> Thank you. My, my second question, we're fortunate to have Bruce McPherson on our board. We started discussions with the electrical supplier, the Monterey Bay Power, um, about rate issues because we're going to be forced to charge these buses during the day when the rates are high. And that's a problem for us. And they're, they're a public spirit agency. And so uh, yeah. we need some discussions about how we might deal with these rates what they might charge, you know, it's very kind of a unique customer in a way. They've um, already indicated that they're willing to put together a tariff package for us to help us with rates. Um, they're really also in the beginning of their EV program. Um, we've been talking with MST and San Benito um, as well. Um, Barrow and I went to a Monterey Bay Power um, board meeting and spoke and uh, they heard our presentation and our questions and our concerns about rates with PG&E, and they said they absolutely can help us with that. So, um, yes, yeah. Thank you very much. I think it's really important for us to start early in those discussions because there's going to be a lot of money. If we were paying the standard rates for this charging on a customer level, we wouldn't be able to run these buses, basically. If I can add, the, the, the big thing I think that we need to sort out is going to be charge management software. A software is going to help when you charge, what time of the day, avoid that peak at the peak, you know. So it's going to be a little bit of operational, but um, there are some companies developing software that will help you keep your energy charges down to the best rates during the day. So it's a combination of things. Thanks for the work. First of all, I'd like to say too, it's been a 
absolute pleasure of working with Aaron throughout the years. So thank Is it just because I live in Felton? Staying there. Yeah, on behalf or to answer of Guadalupe Bay Community Power, uh, we, we understand this and we are really happy to be, uh, be part of this. Uh, Having the situation of this being literally a uh, metro being a day-long service presents some challenges because the charging rates are higher midday. So we are targeting, as we speak, and I've just, uh, we'll be discussing this at our next meeting next month, um, we'll be targeting school buses, the diesel buses, because they're morning and afternoon and you have this time to charge uh, at, at some better times for rate procedures. So that's where our target is at Monterey Bay Community Power initially for buses take these diesel buses off that are carrying these young children is going to be uh, a win-win for sure. But uh, we, we have our eye on the ball, but that's where we're starting, and uh, we're going to put that in place very soon. Great. Thank you. Any other questions, Brent? Go ahead. I, I think when this came up, too, is I asked staff about um, the grant opportunities from Water Bay Community Power, and I think I had a response that some of the funding did come from that resource. Um, so they're a collaborative partner, and I'd like to make sure that this is probably one of their grants that they're just initially getting started with in, in issuing, um, having been only in service really for a year at this point. So I, I'd like to make sure that we get some recognition there, maybe uh, kudos to them on somehow a, a logo somewhere for what we're providing um, from that grant to and collaborating with the, you know, the, the agencies together to make this happen for our community. Um, and, it, and I also want to say thank you for the service that you provided. We've touched base quite a bit on different projects um, since my time on here, and I've appreciated working with you and the response of you getting back to me on the types of questions that I've had as well. So thank you, and good luck to your adventure, your new adventure. Any other questions? Anyone from the public want to weigh in on this? Seeing none, uh, oh, Joe, Joe, come on up. Yeah, I'm sorry. Hi, I just want to say, that Aaron is the best, hands down, the best manager I have ever had. <laughs> um, she's been an amazing person to know, to work for, and to see every day. Um, she's such a great leader and so inspiring, and always has a smile on her face, <laughs> and very supportive, and she knows so much. It's a huge loss to us. But I wish her all the best. Thanks, Sharon. Before I let you go, Aaron, I just want to throw in my little two cents. Uh, you know, I don't want to minimize any of the other jobs you've done for this agency, but as far as I'm concerned, your legacy will always be bringing duty cases across the finish line, which was a big accomplishment. I know you're, you're, you got to be proud of that because it was not an easy task, and uh, I wish you all the best. And uh, I'm going to have a vote, and then I'm going to let you say whatever you want to say uh, right. I, 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 since you've regained your composure. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, <clears throat> well, I will just quickly say that um, to all the, the beautiful people that work here at Metro, I, uh, I, it's so overwhelming. So many people have reached out and, and made a point to come and see me and come and talk to me and get a hold of me. And uh, there's been such a, a message of um, understanding, they, uh, understanding my decision to leave. It was very difficult. This last year has <laughs> been... Uh, tough for all of us, and um, uh, the support has been great. Everybody has, you know, said we're so sad to see you go, but we're really happy for you, and, and they're very supportive. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's it. Thank you so much for the, the love and support everybody has shown. It's um, made it even more difficult. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, to take us to item 14, this is authorized a public hearing on a fixed route free fare program. Hi, thank you, Jamie Afton, uh, Marketing and Customer Service. I have made it through my first few months and they've been a bit of an adventure, so I'm glad to be here with my first item before the board. Um, I'm asking that a public hearing be set for next month so that we can discuss the proposal to bring a free fare program forward for legally blind individuals riding our system. Um, I'm the, the goal is to uh, address some continuing concerns regarding our ticket vending machines and their um, accessibility to that particular audience. 
the purpose of this program would be to allow uh, that audience to ride our buses without any um, issue. And uh, at the time that we are able to uh, replace ticket vending machines or move to some other technology, um, we would uh, at that point propose suspending this program. Uh, I know I'm trying to be mindful of the time of the board. I know we have a number of uh, additional agenda items uh, to get through, so I am open for questions if you would like to discuss. Dr. Rockins, do you have a ballpark estimate of how many uh, we would be going to ride our bus? I have no idea. It's a tough question to parse because obviously we don't, you know, have any information about the um, backgrounds of our customers. Um, about 12.7% 12 uh, 12 of our customers ride on a discount pass. Now that discount pass is available to both elderly as well as disabled customers. And of course that's um, all types of disabilities. Um, so we are talking about roughly half of the discount pass users um, who, are, uh, who qualify as disabled users. Um, and then of course a smaller percentage of that group are, are legally blind. In Santa Cruz County, according to the 2010 census data, we have about 6,000 individuals who identify as legally blind. Now, of course, not all of those individuals ride our system, but we serve about 5 million trips a year, so that gives you some sense of the scale that we're looking at. Thank you. Any other questions to the board? Any we'll approval of the uh, item? Yeah, I was thinking of any questions from the public on this, or comments? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for action. Then I'll move that we approve saying this here. Second. second. Motion by uh, Rodkin, second by McPherson. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, this is a uh, item 15 received an update on the Santa Cruz County RCC Rail Ford Alternative Analysis Study and Scope. Harold, welcome. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, Board. Um, very quickly, I want to jump on the Erin bandwagon and just note uh, the thanks from the planning department. She's been a good friend of the planning department, and we especially appreciate all her help. And one more very important initiative, we all know the mantra, 63 buses is now 47 on its way to 34. Thank you for the help over the last two years in making the solution and the plan to that. So I'll get back on task, but thank you. All right, very quickly, for your information, in agenda item 15 is the final scope of work for the Unified Quarter Investment Study Alternatives Analysis. You do in your packet, they have three replacement pages because we produced the version before August 1st, made some minor changes, so you're provided three pages, very small amount of changes. The heart of them were more emphasis on what we all have learned to refer to as triple bottom line analysis. The Metro staff is very happy. We've developed this scope together with the RTC staff and we're looking forward to the execution of the project. This is an opportunity to establish facts about service features, operating and capital costs, land use assumptions having to do with densities in neighborhoods or on stations. Ridership, which is based on proximity and origins and destinations, the ease of the access networks, walking bikes, Uber, Lyft, other buses, et cetera, et cetera. And the most important issue to Metro is to establish a real analysis of this county's funding capacity for transportation transportation related projects over the next 30 or 40 years. Because there's only so many dollars to go around for our different features. We feel that all this information will allow us to make an objective decision that is data driven. Lastly, as you may know, the RTC directed that a task force of three Metro and three RTC board members and or commissioners be established to oversee the project. I think that's a great idea, and I think it will be really helpful in keeping our eye on the ball of the technical analysis. This project should be concluded in about 13 or 14 months, so we should have a solution in early 21. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Vera? Okay, any questions from the public? Okay, this is just to receive an update, so no action is necessary. Thank you for that update. And with that, I'll go away. Uh, how about an update on uh, Pacific Station? Thank you again. Um, it has been established that the most viable opportunity to address the funding needs of this project are to pursue an affordable housing and sustainable communities state grant to make up the funding shortfall of the current proposal. 
We will also be applying for the less likely to be successful federal program referred to as BUILD. Metro and city staff are working towards a February 20 AHSC application and a July 2020 BUILD application. The task at hand for the team from the city and us is to meet all of the grant application requirements, generally including a lot of things, but in the big picture, we have to have a final project definition. We need to have a confirmed local funding package. We need to move through some local government approvals. Projects got to be through some zoning and project approval steps of the city. And lastly, there's two parts to it, but we need to have some levels of environmental clearance for both the transit facility and the redevelopment facility, the residential commercial retail site. But that's what that's our assignment for the next few months. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, Rick? No, I, I spoke yesterday with uh, Bonnie Lips, so I'm just, I'm not used to this. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll just report, and I'm sure you know this, but I just, uh, for the benefit of the rest of the board, um, um, they had uh, economic development has uh, put out a scope, uh, has gotten a scope from the consultant, Mark Thomas, to verify the layout for the circulation, just to make sure that, uh, in fact, we understand precisely what it is. That's your understanding as well. Oh, right, that's actually, that's what I've been working on. Yeah. So to be very clear, we did some generic layouts yeah. to meet the 24 bay requirements with different plots of land many months ago. We then, once that all got established, we brought back our service planning team to actually put the real metro operation over this generic, and we identified a few things that could be done slightly better. So now Mark Thomas and Dan Boyle and Associates us are taking a second run through those. And I just received Mark Thomas's latest ideas yesterday, Bonnie and I are meeting okay. next week. Great. Um, they have just gotten out an RFQ uh, for affordable housing developers um, uh, for this project, uh, as well as others. and. Um, so uh, they will uh, release that shortly. Maybe you should tell them what the RFQ stands for. Oh, re uh, yeah. A request for qualifications. Uh, that is, affordable housing developers interested in uh, being a partner in this project. So um, there are a number of really good ones um, in the area. They expect to release the RFQ in three weeks and then get uh, returns in a month or so in October. And then we will have an idea of who the potential partners are for the affordable housing component. Um, not that they will be committed to this project, but that they're qualified and interested. Um, and that will lay the groundwork for the um, grant coming up. Um, the um, uh, economic development is also um, working with Weber Hayes, the environmental consultant, um, to include both uh, the city and the NIAC pro um, property that we bought. Uh, uh, Institute for what is it? Uh, yeah. uh, for the uh, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> non nonprofit insurance alliance in California. That's what it is. All right. I got it. <laughs> 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 uh, it was in there somewhere. What do the letters stand for? As I think, board knows that the city purchased that property, um, and apparently uh, the NIAC. Um, is building on the west side, a new, new facility. They will be out by uh, early January. Um, Santa Cruz Community Health Centers may be interested in occupying the building. So there'll be some space, and you probably know this as well. So um, there's some space in play in that site for perhaps um, transitional purposes. Anyway, just to let the board know, there's progress being made on a lot of the aspects of details for this project to go forward. So no action, but people are working on it. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Any comments from the public? Okay, that's a uh, update. So uh, you know, we need to take an action. We'll move on to uh, item 17. This is approve a resolution of board directors uh, compensation benefits. This is, I'm going to direct this to our attorney, Julie Sherman, for some guidance on this. Sure, thank you. So this is called a resolution of uncertainty. And, that should um, be good. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> and the whole point of this resolution is to recognize the fact that the labor organization MOUs have expired. 
And part of the labor negotiations, part of the possibility of the negotiations is to uh, agree on effective salaries as of the day after the expiration. So July 1st would be the effective date, if that <coughs> is the, what the bargaining parties agree to. Um, and this resolution of uncertainty is basically saying, because the uh, MOUs have expired, that means their uh, wages and benefits are uncertain as of this date. And that provides the board the ability to go back in time and make the wages effective July 1st. Uh, because under the California Constitution, somebody could challenge that as a gift of public funds. And so what you're saying is, it's not a gift of public funds if, if we ultimately do that, because their compensation is not fixed right now. And so this is a, a benefit for the employees if the board adopts this, so that you are able to make wages effective July 1st, rather than when you ultimately approve the final MOUs. So I think you should do it, so that you're able to do that if that's where bargaining takes you. Great, thanks for that uh, introduction. Any questions? Any questions from the public? Okay. Second. Motion by Rodkin, a second by Leopold. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 That motion carries unanimously. Um, okay, we're going to 17 A and B, which uh, 17 A is going to be item 9 13. This is a approved consideration of ratification of the contract with Alliance Insurance. So, need some more clarification. Thank you. <coughs> Um, so BSP has been Metro's uh, vision provider for many, many years, and the contract expired on July 31st of 2019 with no option to renew. Um, Metro issued a new request for proposals um, for employee vision care insurance, and we legally advertised it, and to, we gave information to 12 firms, but we only received four proposals. Now, our evaluation team reviewed in detail all four proposals and selected a proposal that matched our current contract. Now, um, what we are asking today is that you ratify a contract with Alliance Insurance. Um, our employees will continue with the same level of service given by BSP, so we will continue receiving the same service by BSP, but we are going to be using Alliance Services as our broker for this insurance. Um, by, by us doing this, we'll be receiving 11% of monthly savings, uh, which will give us a roughly amount of 14K per year in savings. Um, as a member and using also the insurance, just last week I was able to go to my eye doctor. I paid the same amount, I gave him the same information. And we don't have insurance cards for vision insurance. All we do and give to the eye doctor is our name, our social security, and they find us in the system. So me going to the doctor last year and uh, when I went to the doctor last week, it was the same thing, nothing changed. The same co-payment in the same service. Um, so our evaluation team recommends that our, um, that you ratify our contract for employee vision care insurance to Alliant for a term not to exceed seven years in an amount not to exceed of $701,500. And so a quick question for you is if we do not ratify this, our, our employees would be without benefits. Thank you. And did you say BSP did not uh, offer to? They did, but the amount uh, by us going with Alliant will provide us a savings. And okay. so that's why we chose Alliant as our broker. I just said that they didn't respond. They, they did. They did respond. At a higher rate. They were one of the four. Okay. They were one, one of the four. Yes. Okay. Director Coppin, go Thank you. Do uh, in the process, did you also compare uh, the network in making sure that there was no gap in the providers uh, that they had from the old plan to this current one? Correct. It's the same. It's the same network. Director Lee. Um, the the concern that was raised was whether this is a negotiable 
um, uh, piece, and I'm curious what our uh, attorney says. Sure. So, um, you know, the basic principle is if the benefits are changing, it is a bargainable matter. Uh, my understanding of the facts are this is the same exact insurance. It's just, it's still VSP insurance. It's instead of buying it from VSP directly, you're getting it from a broker. But nothing is changing. Correct. And uh, am I correct in, in when I read this that the, the memo, the report doesn't say that the, that the unions uh, approved this. They, they had a chance to participate in the draft specifications. And that's what they did uh, respond to. I don't have an answer for that. That would be an answer that my director can respond to that. Yeah, my, my concern, and I look, look forward to public comment, um, is uh, provision of benefits. I understand the concern that, uh, that uh, people didn't feel as though they were um, uh, consulted well enough. Uh, but I also share concern that um, it could be a forest and trees argument, which is uh, we the, uh, employees would lose a benefit until a new one could be initiated that may not result in any difference except people would be without coverage. So um, as, as I weigh that, I think it's important that uh, our constituent unions be consulted on, on the provision of benefits. That, that's without a doubt. Um, but I'm concerned also about the loss of benefits um, for something that at least is being uh, uh, shared with us as virtually identical to what we had before. So I'll, I'll be curious about that. Yeah, I, that would be a question for Don. No, not, not for you, but for, for others. Any other questions from directors? I'm going to go ahead and open it up to the public. Uh, comments on this? Come on up. <laughs> So, Article 7.1, under MOU, the union shall be given 10 working days advance written, not email, written notice of any personal matter ordinance, rule, resolution, regulation, or acting affecting working conditions related to matters within the scope of representation, proposed to be adopted by Metro Board Directors, or management. The union shall be given the opportunity to meet and confirm with Metro representatives prior to its adoption except in cases of qualified emergency. I never received an email. I checked all of my emails from Dawn. I didn't know of such committee, nor was I invited of such committee. I'm just learning about this. Some of our members, as you heard from the public outcry, they had just heard about this. I don't know anything about it. I'm only basing something that I'm hearing without meeting or really understanding if it really has impacts. What I'm noticing from Metro, more and more they're doing this. The CEO just had given orders to our supervisors to do something that was not within their scope of work without giving them. They must be really concerned about this coming through. What I suggest is you can perhaps modify your approval um, so that if there's any concerns that the unions come up through a meeting that we can have with management, perhaps we can come back and you can modify your, I don't know if your rules, but you can modify your decision. That's my best thinking so that it doesn't hurt the membership. Um, because at this point, I see Metro at fault of this, but I also don't want to hurt my old members. So I'm trying to figure out how to work with the board, um, and I hope you hold Metro accountable for making this mistake. Okay. So for, for a bit of background, uh, when Robin Slater was here several years ago, HR manager, there was a procedure that she developed that was in place that was used for many, many years whenever uh, HR-related contracts were going out to bid, whenever we were going to issue a procurement for a new contract. Um, 
the procedure involved uh, getting uh, the feedback and, and getting input from both unions. Um, throughout this procedure, they were invited uh, to be on the evaluation team if it was an RFP. Uh, that procedure is all printed. It, purchasing has a copy of that procedure. HR has been given a copy of that procedure. But since Robin left, there's been a lot of pushback and that procedure has um, fallen away and not really been adhered to. So I just wanted to give you that background. Thank you. issue is with the process. Um, obviously, water no risk there remain covered. If you guys are going to sit here and say that nothing has changed, then nothing has changed. We'll uh, take your word on that. However, the process wasn't followed. We do have sent information requests and checked our, on our end for this email. It doesn't exist. You're also obligated to meet and confer with us. It didn't happen. You'll see the grievance for that on a separate issue. That, uh, but the, in my opinion, that's different than actual ratification. Uh, breach of a contract is a separate issue, and we'll deal with it as a separate issue. Um, we need to have those benefits continue. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Nathan Meisenheimer again. Um, as a eye doctor um, patient, I'm just this is the first time I'm hearing of this. Um, I was about to schedule an appointment for myself and my kids since school starting to get their eyes checked, and I have a VSP card in my wallet. So my question is: Is this official? Can I call and make an appointment? Yes, the answer is yes. I had an appointment last week. You, you can't speak. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Come on, you're crying. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. It's my first time here. And the answer is yes. You can. I just had my appointment last week. I gave them the same information that I did for the last few years. I, I wear contact lenses, so. Okay. The answer is yes. Okay. Just wanted to confirm that. Make sure there was no no loopholes because we didn't get any emails. I received nothing in the mail regarding any changes. And last thing I want to do is make an appointment, assuming I have VSP, and go in there and then wind up with a bill saying we don't deal with Alliance. So I just wanted to get that confirmed. Thank you. Any other comments? Yeah, I just want to make a comment before I open it up because I think I may summarize this for everybody. I think the intent of the board is to uh, our biggest concern is we don't want the employees to drop any benefits that are pre-existing. I think we can all acknowledge that. I can also acknowledge that there was some loophole that existed here, but since Don's not here to defend herself, I'm, I'm not going to be entertaining any kind of piling onto that. There's a reason that it happened, and I think we all need to explore that and, and take steps to make sure it doesn't happen again. So I'm hoping I can get a motion from this board that's something to the nature of uh, that we want to continue the benefits with the understanding there's absolutely no reduction in whatever the services that are provided and that we make efforts to solve this. Mr. Leopold, you might have a motion in, in mind. Yes, I would move the recommended actions with an additional direction that HR sit down with our constituent unions to review the benefits and report back at our next meeting about whether there are any changes that we would need to consider um, so to ensure that there's no uh, uh, decline in benefits. I'll second that. I, I have a motion and a second. Additional comment by Director Rodman. Uh, I'd like to add an item which may hold this friendly, which is that we also direct the uh, staff to um, develop a clear protocol for how unions are notified of um, renegotiation, I guess it would be, or something of uh, any of the sort of uh, benefit contracts that we have. Today. I see that as a friendly amendment. And a second also? Yep. And Director Matthews. I suspect also friendly. Clearly, there's a need to inform the employees immediately about this and how to access the benefits, reassuring them there's no change in the level of benefit, just the provider. Yeah. And the process. Yeah. I, I think everyone in the room can agree that this was not handled correctly, and we will make efforts to uh, to remedy that. If, if that needs to be part of the motion, I'm happy to accept this part. And a second. Okay, I think. We might be all in agreement on this one issue. So with that, uh, I'm going to call a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you for that discussion, everybody. Um, we're going to go to item 17B, which also is known as uh, item 915. This is approval of the final SEIU okay. position descriptions. Who's going to start that? I'll start because I pulled it. Okay. 
Um, my, my comment is basically that um, what's contained in these job descriptions, I don't believe is that issue. There are questions about compensation for it, when it should happen, um, whether the, uh, the study was well done on the question of whether they adequately compensated people for all the duties listed in the job descriptions. But my understanding is nobody is actually challenging that they do these things. They're the result of interviews with them, and that, that's already been before them. And it was before them as long ago as last November, I think, ultimately, in terms of when the, in terms of starting the process. So I don't see any reason to not approve this, even though I pulled it. But I wanted to make sure that people in the audience had a, a chance to comment, because otherwise it was going to be take, you know, it was going to go through the consent agenda. So I have nothing else to add. That's my view. I could be persuaded that I don't understand something, but that's where I'm at. Any questions of directors? Mr. Leopold, well, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, less of a question, but I, I know that one of the concerns we hear from employees is that we don't have enough staff to cover the jobs that we have, and I want to make sure that we are recruiting successfully for these jobs. And so I share Director Rockin, multiple Director Rockin's sentiments. I understand the uh, concern uh, 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 from the labor representatives, and uh, uh, most of these issues seem to be part of the negotiation which we're taking very seriously. Any other questions or comments from directors? I'm going to open it up to the public for comment. I just wanted to clarify a couple things that um, by Chair Lockett is that there were um, everything you explained in terms of the process of a study was done. However, when we met and conferred for weeks and weeks and weeks, there were added um, duties, not based on the, the study, but because we agreed to add more duties on certain positions. I think mostly what I hear from the membership is they're very, very scared of this going through without any increase because in good faith, they agreed to so many changes to their job descriptions and not getting compensated. For those changes. So I think I hear the fear from our members and I want to express that to you guys. But just to clarify, um, Mr. Rockin, there was um, added duties per an agreement that we made. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Sure, come on in. So just to clarify the way that we we're introduced to this whole job description thing. And we're like, we have a job description currently on file in a binder that we use for hiring purposes and whatnot. And then we were instructed to go through it and then add what else do we do? So that the purpose was to find comparable agencies with the same type of job description. And so we did that. And the next thing we know, they updated our job description to match what we do. And then they went forward with the other 10 agencies and just went with the same job title and just compared us based on job title, not based on what is underneath that job title, in the sense that we are doing more than the department, same department over at Riverside or we're doing more than the same department over at SVT. So what we feel is that we're not being accurately represented when compared with these other agencies, and that is probably our biggest beef within our department. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any other comments? Again, um, I can't speak on the rest of the members, um, but my position especially, uh, I'm the upholster, and I was one of the ones that was interviewed by the CPS uh, agency, and when they were asking me what I, was, what I did on a daily basis, I told them everything that I do. I'm the upholster, but yet I have been asked to do a lot of the body shop technician um, work. We Metro doesn't want to hire a body technician because they say that it's, there's not enough work for that one position, and yet on a day-to-day -day basis, my, I do more body shop stuff than I even do upholstery stuff. So when I told the lady, um, and I gave him all my information 
of what I do on a daily basis, she said that I, that I could not be compared to two different positions and then that they would not be adding that stuff to my job description. And yet when they came back, they all they had not, my current job description, sorry, um, says assist body technician. When it came back, the duties were just added onto my job description. So that's just what my concern with the job description going through your day and not being, you know, accurately uh, compared to other agencies. When you look at BTA and you look at their pulser, there is no body technician stuff on the, on the on the upholsterer's job description. When you look at Golden Gate, it's only upholstery stuff. There's nothing to do with body technician stuff. I also um, install advertising panels. I, draw, I drive all the way to San, San Leandro to pick up buses that are being repaired um, at other vendors and bring them back. That is no, not on job descriptions for other agencies. So, you know, for us, for us to be adding all these extra job duties and not being compensated for them correctly, it's just, it, you know, it doesn't help the morale in the shop. And that's just, I'm just speaking on my job description, but I know a lot of the other guys that I represent in the mechanic fleet maintenance um, also take on a lot of other jobs that are not on their job description. Thank you. Okay, so I just want to thank you for giving all of our members the opportunity to speak. I really appreciate that. And I'm happy, but thank you so much for giving us the opportunity. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other comments from the public? I wouldn't have, but today is my last day, so um, I will share with you that I experienced the same thing that uh, you're hearing about today, and it was definitely a factor in uh, my decision to, to um, take another position. So. Uh, please, I hope you, you listen. I support them and <coughs> experience the same thing, and it doesn't feel very good. So, <laughs> um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bring it back to the staff. <coughs> well, in the, in the testimony we got, the, I think my earlier description is still accurate, which is to say people are not complaining about the job description, but there's a dispute, which is quite real, that's going on at negotiations about whether people are being adequately compensated for the, uh, did the study, to, for the uh, changes, any changes in their job description for what had been before, or the, that the comparisons might not have been appropriate and so forth, but there's not an argument here that the, these are not the jobs people are doing, basically, and been asked to do, and um, so, I'm not going to weigh in, believe me, on the question of the negotiations and how that's going to get resolved. But I don't think the question is the job, the problem is not the job description, the issue, whatever your position is on it, about how, how the study came out in the end and whether the compensation is adequate for doing these jobs. So I still feel I'm in a position to move approval of these job descriptions and that I, hopefully the negotiation process will allow us to have a fuller discussion about whether or not the job changes as they exist are being adequately compensated. And I agree with uh, Director Rutkin's comments that to me, uh, it's only benefiting employees if the if we are adopting accurate job descriptions, um, and those you know what we are listing recruiting for should be accurate, <coughs> so that there's no surprises when <coughs> employees are hired, and I think it also just helps um, in a better position in negotiations to be able to be more accurate and take the information that employees have provided and what their actual duties involve. So uh, I understand and, and appreciate the opportunity to be heard, but I think this update and classifications are beneficial in, in, in all areas. So. I'll go ahead and second the motion. And it's also my understanding that um, there are, in fact, um, vacancies that need to be filled. and. Um, for the best uh, uh, hire, we need to have an updated description, and that's part of what's being covered in this action. Um, Michael, you want to say something? Yeah, I'm gonna, yeah. Sorry, uh, I just want to touch base on Anna's uh, uh, comment. Yeah, I, I do agree, but it doesn't feel good when you add all these uh, duties to your job description, and then when your position comes back as being wide rated in negotiation. So, uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going to quick comment. I'm, you know, I, I'm struggling with this because 
what I think about is, you know, is, is we all have represent different cities here. There's larger cities, Santa Cruz and Watsonville, compared to Scotts Valley and Capitola. And I know that when you get when we compare bus, we ideally the classic comp idea is is try to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges, and sometimes it's hard to do. I know that. Um, um, in larger cities, Santa Cruz, they have multiple positions to, to do different variety of jobs, whereas in Capitola, one person has to do all three of those jobs. So I think this could be a similar thing to what's happening here. I don't have a solution for it off the top of my head. I know that it exists and it happens, and it could be just a, a, a difficulty between the organizations. Uh, I know that class and comp study is, 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 is you know, requested by a lot of agencies, and sometimes if, you know, if you're on the winning end of that, it's a great thing, and if you're not, not so great. Uh, still doesn't mean I have a solution for this. I, I'm concerned about the comments. I think all the comments are real. I think they're all valid. Um, not sure how we move forward with this. Director Coffin um, Yes, thank you, Director. I, I guess, is there a grievance process if there is this job app, uh, description that's put together that gets flushed out so that it gets clarified of really what that job is for the, the employee that's in that role? And, and, and making the revisions of what their description is before and after? I, I can have Angela talk a little bit about the process. I just want to reiterate, this was an extensive process to go through the reevaluations. The employees participated in that. The union, the union signed off on I was closer, but thank you. The union signed off on every one of the positions before you. I'm a little bit astounded about pushback today. Uh, those, those job descriptions were then taken and evaluated against other agencies. The chair is correct, particularly in small agencies. Uh, it's very difficult to find absolutes where people are matched against other agencies identically. It just doesn't happen because uh, depending on the position you take on other types of job responsibilities. We hired a professional organization, CPS, to look at that data and to try to sift that down to a recommendation and that's what they have. Those CPS pay recommendations, which are a part of another process, were based on those job descriptions. Thank you. Director Lynn. And I, I too, being from a small agency years ago, we've had some class and comp studies that we were frustrated with, too, because we can't compare. That's why you wear many hot hats as well. And it's it uh, became frustrating where, in our case, the class and comp study wasn't helpful to us. And we were better, we felt we were better to negotiate just on a percentage basis because we ran into the same problem. It, it just, there wasn't a way to compare apples to apples if you're in a smaller agency to a larger agency. It just, it's just not. And so we experienced, when I was the negotiator in my, my agency, some of the same frustrations and finally decided it was better to negotiate separately, individually, and not try to it wasn't helpful for us to have a class and comp study. It just didn't. Thank you, Director. Um, yeah, I just wanted to put in some comments and, and listening to the, the commenters. Um, I think one of the fears that, the, that I'm, I'm understanding is that when we did, did the study and these folks got added, these duties are, weren't added, but <clears throat> the job description was changed uh, a bit for them, that their compensation is based on the lower end of, of the of the of the position, uh, just like the upholster, he's probably doing some auto body work, and and but he's being looked at as the, the upholster versus the, the scale of a, of an auto body worker. So I, I think their fear is that they they're, they're going to be required to do two two different jobs, but get paid at the lower end of of the of the of one of those positions. And and I and I can kind of relate to that. You know, it's it's just. You're asked, and what you're doing at this agency, you're going to get compensated for the, the, that lower lower position versus the, the higher position. Director um, I think that the point by my colleague just made is is a good one, but it, it does seem clear that the que that the question of pay is a negotiation issue that we have to take very seriously. Um, but it's uh, but in terms of the description, the job description, and the process we went through to develop the job description, that seems to uh, to be w without question. We we are going to wrestle with the question of pay, um, 
but it, this doesn't seem about approving job descriptions so they can go out and start recruiting. Is it, 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 this isn't the right point? But we should be uh, at the negotiating table, figuring out what to do, how we look at that that uh, that uh, class and comp study, what kind of um, uh, uh, pay or or uh, we need to be offering in order to remain competitive, uh, and uh, hopefully come uh, quickly to uh, 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 an agreement uh, for the benefit of the employees and for the community. So I feel comfortable. Uh, you know, I will support the motion uh, because I think that we want to get these uh, job descriptions and these uh, the positions filled, and I remain hopeful that we can get back to the, the table and figure out these issues so we can resolve them as quickly as possible. I'm going to go ahead and hold myself accountable here. We have a motion in a second. I'm going to call the question. So at this point, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. OK, that takes us to item uh, 18. This is a review of items to be discussed in closed sessions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we have two closed sessions. We've got one on existing litigation and one on anticipated litigation. And Gina, there will not be any announcements coming out of closed session. Okay, well, with that, uh, I just want to make an announcement. The next meeting will be Friday, September 27th at 9 a.m. the Santa Cruz City Council. And is there anybody that wants to address any of the items that are on? Yeah, technically the next meeting is right after the session. Is that on here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Yes. So all of us, once we adjourn our regular meeting, we'll come back into open session, we'll adjourn, and we're going to start our special meeting. Right. Okay, so that special meeting will be following the closed session. Immediately yeah. Immediately following. <laughs> and the topic of that meeting? Labor negotiations. Labor negotiations, okay. Great. With SMART 23. Great, thank you. Uh, with that, anybody want to address any of the items that are on the closed session? Seeing none, we will recess to the closed session.